Hello and welcome back to Nunley Math. We are wrapping up our uh, unit on factoring with our fourth method for factoring today. We're going to talk about factoring by grouping. Then in our next video, we're going to talk about how we can tie all this together. And we may take a video or two after that to um, tie up some loose ends and look at some problems we can solve. But by and large, this is really the, the last of the large ideas we need to talk about for this unit, factoring by grouping. Now, this one's actually kind of fun for me because because when you look at it, it starts off looking like a large, scary polynomial. Um, most people in my class happen to look at this and say, oh, well, this is a cubic polynomial, cubic because the highest exponent uh, term is a three, and polynomial because it has more than three terms, and that tends to be very scary for them. In our mind, we think more terms equals harder problems, but that's actually not necessarily the case. Um, when we are factoring by grouping, you may find that this is easier than using the guess and check method to solve trinomials. Now, just as a matter of review, Keep in mind that we always start off looking for the GCF, even if I don't mention it in the video. The reason for that is because pulling out the GCF will, first of all, make some problems much, much easier to factor, and other problems it will be impossible for us to factor with the methods we've learned if the GCF is still in place. That tends to happen if the GCF includes a variable. Now, when I look at each of these terms, 6, 9, and 6, all have common factors of 3, but 4 does not share that common factor. So this does not have a greatest common factor. We can look for this regardless of the number of terms in the polynomial. The second thing we always want to do is check to see if it is a binomial, and if it is, we want to look for difference of squares patterns. Notice that since this has four terms, it is not a binomial. Binomials have two terms, so this does not apply here. Please keep in mind that we do have a, a trick or a pattern that we use when um, looking at factoring binomials, and that is if you have a perfect square minus a perfect square, it does break down into a plus b and a minus b. Remember that sum of squares does not factor. So we have the difference of squares pattern, and we have the fact that sum of squares does not factor. Neither of those apply here because this polynomial has four terms. The third thing we do is we check to see if it's a trinomial, and if it's a trinomial, we look for the trinomial squares patterns. Trinomial squares pattern says if you have a perfect square at the beginning and a perfect square at the end, and the center is two times the roots, and you have either a plus or minus sign here and a plus sign here, then it breaks down or factors into a plus b times itself or a minus b times itself. If neither of those patterns work, then we go on to the guess and check method if it is a trinomial. This one's not a trinomial, so we will not do that. If any of the things that I've reviewed here are tricky or difficult or challenging for you, I do have videos on those. You are going to want to go back and check those before you watch this particular video. Now, if it's a polynomial with four terms, we're going to factor by grouping. Factor by grouping. And this is actually a whole lot easier than it at first appears. The first thing you're going to want to do is make sure that your polynomial is in standard form. Remember, standard form says that you have the highest degree exponent first, the next degree exponent next, the next, and you go in descending order. So x cubed followed by x squared, x to the first, and x to the zero is what we have on any constant. And then we're going to use the associative property to regroup the terms. The associative property says that if all you have is one long string of addition, you can regroup that addition any way you want. Now, notice this does have subtraction, but we're thinking of this as being plus negative 9, plus negative 9. This is subtraction, so we're thinking of this as being plus negative 6, plus negative 6. And so as long as we're keeping that minus sign in the same position it would be if it was a plus negative 6, we can use this associative property. Notice I put the first two terms together, and I put the last two terms together. Then, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to factor out the greatest common factor of the first pair. Remember, the very first thing we did was look for a GCF for all of our terms. Notice that we said this did not have a GCF that works for all of them. This time, we're just checking to see if the first pair have a GCF. 6x cubed minus 9x squared. Notice that both 6 and 9 have a 3 hidden inside of them. And notice that both terms have at least 
two x's. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out everything they have in common, and that's going to be the 3 and the x squared. 3x squared times 2x gives me the 6x cubed, and 3x squared times 3 gives me the 9x squared. See how that works? I did that kind of quickly, so if that uh, is, is confusing for you, go ahead and work on multiplying these back together and make sure that you do get what we started with. I'm then going to go through and factor out the GCF of the second pair. Notice you have a 4x and you have a 6. We're looking for things they have in common. Both of these, of course, have a 2. And when I pull out a 2, 2 times 2x makes 4x. 2 times minus 3 gives me the minus 6. Now, this next part is the cool part, but it only works if what's inside of the parentheses matches. Notice I have 3x squared times 2x minus 3, and I have 2 times 2x minus 3. If both of these match, here's what I can do. I can use the distributive property to reorganize this equation. In other words, I can take that 3x squared and that plus 2, and I can put those together and make the binomial 3x squared plus 2. I then take my 2x minus 3, and I just recognize that I've used it twice. This is your final solution. 3x squared plus 2 times 2x minus 3. That's this polynomial in factored form. Now, I do want to mention a couple things. I mentioned this as being the distributive property. When we learned multiplying polynomials, we learned that this 3x squared is going to get multiplied by both of these. Well, that's just what this says right here. And then we learned that the 2 has to get multiplied by both of these. That's what this says. Take the 2 times both. You see, this is just a rearrangement of this. It's like saying if I have 5 of something and I have, I don't know, 8 of something, that's the same as having 5 plus 8 or 13 of that thing. It's just a way of reorganizing our thoughts. The big question people often ask is why don't we write the 2x minus 3 twice? The whole point of writing it in this form is so we don't have to write it twice. I've got 3x times both of these, and I have the 2 times both of these. It's just much shorter or much briefer than what you see here. And that's basically it. Now I am going to erase all the ink on the slide real quick. I do want to make mention of something else. Uh, let's do erase all the ink. There you go. I do want to mention one other thing that um, often people ask about. The reason that this is so much easier than using the guess and check method on um, on our trinomials is once I've multiplied the 3x times both and the 2 times both, what I end up with is this original problem. What makes factoring trinomials so hard when we're guessing and checking is that ordinarily the middle two terms get combined to make a single term. In factoring by grouping, when you have four terms, basically what's happened is because this was an x squared and this was an x, because these are different degrees, we end up with different degree terms in the middle that will not combine. People think because it has four terms it's harder, but it actually makes it easier because things that ordinarily would be combined that we have to separate are already separated for us. Not too bad, right? Let's do another one. 8x cubed plus 2x squared plus 12x plus 3. Again, we always look for that GCF. This one does not have one. We then go through and look to see if it's a binomial for difference of squares. It's not. We look to see if it's a trinomial. If it's a trinomial, we look for the trinomial squares patterns. If not, we guess and check. Since this has four terms, we're going to jump straight to grouping. Again, I use the associative property to group the first two terms together and the last two terms together. I then go through and I ask myself, what's the GCF of those first two terms? I have an 8 and a 2. Both of those can be divided by a 2. I have an x cubed and an x squared. Both of those have an x squared that can be pulled out. 
your GCF is 2x squared. Well, 2x squared times 4x is what would have given us the 8x cubed. 2x squared times the 1 is what would have given us the 2x squared. So it's broken down like that. I'm going to find the GCF for the second group. Well, both of those have a 3. And what's left over is 4x plus 1. 3 times 4x would be the 12x. 3 times the 1 would be the 3. Notice it's very important that this and this match. Because they match, I can use the distributive property to rearrange. I take the 2x squared and the plus 3, and I make 2x squared plus 3. And then I notice that both of these are 4x plus 1, and so I write that down. And there's your answer. Now, I'm going to highly recommend that you pause the video. You try this next one on your own. See if you can come up with this on your own. I'm going to go ahead and assume that if you wanted to do that, you have already done that. And I'm going to work this one out. Um, notice this minus sign right here. This often throws people off. My personal suggestion to you is that you make that into plus negative. If you had paused the video and that part had created some issues for you, then I would recommend that you now pause the video since we fixed that problem and try it again. I'm going to assume if you wanted to do that, you've already done that, and I'm going to keep going. Associative property lets me regroup. I look for the GCF of the first set, and they both have a 5x cubed. Notice that 5x cubed times x gives me 5x to the fourth, 5x cubed times 1 gives me 5x cubed. Bring down my plus sign. Notice that we have a negative 1x plus 1. Um, the GCF here is actually a 1, but I don't like the fact that this leading coefficient is negative, so I'm actually going to pull out a negative 1, leaving me with x minus 1. Notice these two terms now match 5x minus 1, or 5x cubed times x minus 1 and negative 1 times x minus 1. Since they match, I know I can put these together. 5x cubed minus 1 times x minus 1. And then I just write it all in a single color. Um, if you had tried to pull out just a 1 when factoring this second binomial over here, um, you would have run into issues with these not matching. Pulling out the negative one is a way that, uh, that I help ensure that if it's possible for these to match, then they will. Here's one for you. Thoughts on that? If you've been following through the procedures that I've given you, you would have instantly caught the fact that this does have a GCF for the entire polynomial. That GCF is a 2. Make sure you factor that out first. A lot of people get into a hurry and they start jumping straight to factoring by grouping. If you don't look for that GCF, it's going to make it much, much harder to do all of these problems. Now, having a GCF is going to make this look slightly different, but it doesn't functionally change what we're going to do. Notice, again, I got rid of those minus signs. I think minus signs are confusing, so I've changed them all into plus negatives. I think if you form that habit, you'll find these to be a lot easier. I'm going to set those up into pairs using my associative property. Don't forget to bring your 2 down. Notice that I put braces now instead of parentheses. Um, I do that so that we don't confuse which pairs go together. I'm also fortunate since I'm doing this on the computer that I can color code those. Again, I'm not doing anything with this 2 right now. I'm just dragging it along for the ride. All I'm focusing on is what's inside of those two purple braces. Since I've got it split using the associative property, I want to take that first pair, the x cubed plus x squared. I'm going to look for the GCF, which is x squared. There's what's left over. Notice I brought, went ahead and brought my 2 down, dragged that along for the ride. Plus, I look for the GCF of that second pair, negative 4x plus negative 4. Notice I want that leading coefficient to be a positive number, so I'm going to pull out a negative 4, leaving me with an x plus 1. I do notice that the x plus 1s are the same. It's important you check for that. If they are not the same, then you cannot use this method. Make sure you close your braces. <clears throat> Just like before, the x squared and the minus 4, both come down to make the first binomial, and the x plus 1 is going to be the second binomial. 
again making sure I drag the two along for the ride. Now, if you've been paying very close attention, you might notice that there's something else going on here. Did you catch it? The x squared minus 4 is a difference of squares pattern. This is factored, but it is not factored completely because we know from the difference of squares pattern that if I have a perfect square minus a perfect square, that's actually going to break down into x minus 1, x plus 2. Bring down my 2, bring down my x plus 1. This is actually your final answer. This leads us into what our next video is going to be on, which is factoring completely. The idea that when I factor something, I need to check my answer to make sure that my answer won't factor again. This particular um, solution was not done because there's more ways to split this down. I liken this to working with um, with a number like, let's say, 12. I can take 12 and factor it into a 4 times 3 and be correct. But this is not finished. When we factor something, we like to break it down as far as it can possibly go. We call this in arithmetic factoring to primes. A lot of reasons for that uh, that I won't necessarily get into today, but just know that you want to break it down as much as you can. Um, I will tell you that one reason that we'd like to do this is because 4 times 3 is not the only way that 12 breaks down. It could also be 6 times 2. But if you break it down completely, it's always going to be a 3 and a 2 and a 2. Notice the order of the numbers has changed, but what's inside has not. That's also true with polynomials when we break them down. This is not the only way I could have split this trinomial or this uh, four-term polynomial, but it, once I break it all the way down to the end, we should always get the exact same sets of factors. Again, there's one more for us to try. It looks like this. This one does not have a GCF. It's not a difference of squares. It's not a trinomial of squares. It's not a trinomial at all, which takes me to the grouping method. I come through here and I insert my parentheses using my associative property. Factor out the GCF on the first pair. That's the x cubed, leaving me with 4x plus 3. Then I have the 2x plus 1. At first glance, a lot of people uh, think this does not have a GCF, but it does have a GCF of 1. Everything has at least a GCF of 1, so you can always pull something out. But when you pull that one out, notice that what's inside does not change. Do you notice any problems here? Notice that what's left inside of the parentheses does not match. That means that this was not a binomial times a binomial using rational numbers like we're used to using. This means that this would be considered not factorable. We can't break this down by factoring at all. Now, there are other ways to break this down, but that's a separate unit that we'll talk about later. But when we're talking about the ability to factor it just using the methods we've learned, this cannot be done. Hopefully that's been useful and helpful to you. Hopefully it wasn't too terribly confusing. As I mentioned, we will have another video here before too long where we start tying all these loose ends together and we start talking about factoring larger and larger problems. But I think this is sufficient for today. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch with us. Please leave us a comment in the comment section to let us know if this was helpful to you and make sure you uh, turn on your notifications so that if we produce some other math that might be useful to you, you will certainly know about it. You guys take care of yourselves. Thank you again. Bye-bye.